Hello again, welcome to A Tale of Two Cities today. We don't have any kitties in the room, sorry. Uh, just me. Let's get to uh, book two, chapter three. This is one of the most confusing passages in the book for students, and we normally would read this aloud together in class, so I'm reading it aloud here for you. Uh, I'm probably just gonna read through the first half of the chapter uh, on this video, and then I'll make another video for the second half of the chapter, which again is totally optional. Uh, if you like reading along or listening to me read along, then that's great. If you'd rather just read it on your own, you'll do fine on it uh, without me. Uh, in order to be able to understand book two, chapter three, we actually have to clarify some details from book two, chapter two. So Dickens has already set up some, some details about this court case that's coming up. It's a little strange because we don't know the prisoner. We don't really know what's going on or what happened in the court case. We don't really know why we're there, which actually Dickens has done on purpose. He's putting us in the same shoes as Jerry Cruncher. Remember, we followed Jerry Cruncher from Telson's Bank to this courthouse. Uh, the Old Bailey is the name of the courthouse. And here we are at the Old Bailey witnessing this the way that Jerry Cruncher does. So if we look at this previous paragraph, first off, I, I have to stop and admire the, hor the, the most wonderful description of bad breath. It's worth it. There's this whole paragraph here where it begins, everybody present, except the one wigged gentleman who looked at the ceiling, stared at him. Him would be the prisoner. Everyone turned and looked at the prisoner. All the human breath in the place rolled at him like a sea or a wind or a fire. Eager faces strained round pillars and corners to get a sight of him. Spectators in the back rows stood up not to miss a hair of him. People on the floor of the court laid their hands on the shoulders of the people before them to help themselves at anybody's cost to a view of him. Stood a tiptoe, got upon ledges, stood upon next to nothing to see every inch of him. Conspicuous among these latter, like an animated bit of the spiked wall of Newgate, Jerry stood, aiming at the prisoner, the beery breath of a wet he had taken as he came along and discharging it to mingle with the waves of other beer and gin and tea and coffee and whatnot that flowed at him and already broke upon the great windows behind him in an impure mist and rain. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. So <laughs> Jerry's head, you can picture it sticking up almost like a Bart Simpson head, like a little jagged uh, head up there because his spiky hair is so uh, animated. And he breathes at the prisoner his beery breath. Now, this is the morning time, and Jerry's got beer breath. How? It says here that he took a wet along the way, okay? Uh, so be on his way, we didn't see it, but from Telson's to uh, to the courthouse here, he stopped for a drink. He needed to, you know, stop and spend his money that he already got. Uh, so he got his beer, and now he's here breathing it with all the other breath, and it's all going until there's a, an impure mist, like a total fog on the window behind the prisoner, and it's dripping, and that's the drip of everyone's breath rolling at him together. It's just worth noting. All right. Uh, to clarify forward, let's go to, it's on my, for me, that's on the next page, but there's this big uh, confusing paragraph that says, silence in the court. Charles Darnay had yesterday pleaded not guilty to an indictment denouncing him with infinite jingle and jangle. For that, he was a false traitor to our serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth. Prince, our Lord King, by reason of his having, on diverse occasions and by diverse means and ways, assisted Louis, the French King, in his wars against our said, serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth. That was to say, by coming and going between the dominions of our said, serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, and those of the said French Louis, and wickedly, falsely, traitorously, and otherwise evil adverbiously, revealing to the said French Louis what forces our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, had in preparation to send to Canada and North America. Okay, that sentence is a mouthful and you probably got lost. So don't worry about it. Let's look at it. And what Dickens is doing here is he's actually condensing. This is Dickens going for brevity here. He's condensing all of the all of the things that they would say at the start of a trial in terms of reading out of the charges. And he's condensed it down into one sentence. And he's done so pretty humorously in the way that he presents it. You can tell that Dickens is mocking the whole court system in its ways and how wordy it is. Uh, and on top of that, you also know that there's a lot of that overpraise for the king, the serene, illustrious, excellent, and, yeah, and so forth, whatever. Um, he's throwing that in there. And really, this is all the way that Jerry Cruncher's hearing the charges. 
And ultimately what Charles Darnay, the prisoner, you should write that down on your character chart, Charles Darnay is the prisoner. Uh, what he's been accused of is traveling back and forth between France and England and assisting the French king, which was King Louis, they call him Louis here, in his wars against England. Okay, remember that the American Revolution in 1776, uh, the American Revolution was in full swing. So 1775, it was kind of gearing up. And the accusation is that in 1775, which is five years uh, ago in, in the timeline of the book, that Charles Darnay, the prisoner, was helping the French side by delivering information to them. Okay, He was giving information about uh, what forces we had in preparation to send to North America. Okay, uh, this much Jerry, with his head becoming more and more spiky as the law terms bristled it, made out with huge satisfaction, and so arrived, circuitously, at the understanding that the aforesaid, and over and over again aforesaid, Charles Darnay, stood there before him upon his trial, that the jury were swearing in, and that Mr. Attorney General was making ready to speak. Okay, so all Jerry gets is that, okay, this guy's the prisoner, the jury's doing their thing, and Mr. Attorney General is about to speak. Now, there's a clue for who Mr. Attorney General is at the very end of the chapter. Uh, it's not a term that we use in the U.S., but in England they would know this one. Even Jerry Cruncher, uh, adult that he is, he knows it. It says here at the end that uh, Mr. Attorney General rose to spin the rope, grind the axe, and hammer the nails into the scaffold. Now, all of that is figurative. He's not the executioner. They don't bring him to the trial. Uh, instead, it's referring to the person who's trying to get him executed. This would be the prosecuting attorney. So Mr. Attorney General would be the prosecuting attorney, the one who's trying to find Charles Darnay guilty of treason. Okay, that context gets us ready for chapter three, a disappointment. Mr. Attorney General had to inform the jury that the prisoner before them, though young in years, was old in the treasonable practices which claimed the forfeit of his life. That this correspondence with the public enemy was not a correspondence of today or of yesterday or even of last year or of the year before. That it was certain the prisoner had, for longer than that, been in the habit of passing and repassing between France and England on secret business of which he could give no honest account. That, I'll pause there for a second, uh, just to get the general pattern down of this, we're getting a summary. It's kind of, again, through Cruncher's understanding, uh, we're getting a summary of what the prosecutor is saying in his opening remarks. So far, what has he said? He says that the Prisoner is young, but he's not young when it comes to treason. He's been doing this for time. Uh, and that uh, he has been passing and going back and forth between France and England on some sort of secret business that he can't explain. Hmm, that's, that's pretty serious sounding. And then he says, that if it were in the nature of traitorous ways to thrive, which happily it never was, the real wickedness and guilt of his business might have remained undiscovered. Okay, so if it was natural for traitorous ways to thrive, and then Dickens points out, or the, the more accurately, the prosecutor points out that luckily that's not the case. We have good old natural justice to keep uh, traitors in their place. Uh, that This might have gone undiscovered. But now he shifts. That providence, however, had put it into the heart of a person who was beyond fear and beyond reproach to ferret out the nature of the prisoner's schemes and, struck with horror, to disclose them to His Majesty's Chief Secretary of State and Most Honorable Privy Council. Okay, so the end part there is just disclose it to the authorities. That, that works for us. But providence is the, at the heart of this sentence here. Providence had put it into the heart of a person. What's providence? Providence is referring to God or the angels, or the heavens, uh, that ultimately the heavens had put it into the heart of a person to find out these schemes and then to go tell on the prisoner, okay? So according to the prosecutor, luckily that happened. Uh, thank, thank the heavens. That this patriot, this patriot means the person who told on uh, the prisoner, that this patriot would be produced before them, that his position and attitude were, on the whole, sublime. 
that he had been the prisoner's friend, but at once, in an auspicious and an evil hour, detecting his infamy, had resolved to immolate the traitor he could no longer cherish in his bosom on the sacred altar of his country. So, yes, our prisoner, or our, sorry, our witness, the patriot, uh, was once friends with the prisoner, but he pff, totally threw him under the bus as soon as he felt that he needed to. Why? For the sacred altar of his country. Uh, that, if statues were decreed in Britain, as in ancient Greece and Rome, to public benefactors, this shining citizen would assuredly have had one. That, as they were not so decreed, he probably would not have one. Okay, from this point forward, to, for simplicity's sake, let's refer to this patriot, this witness against the prisoner. We'll refer to him as Statue Man, because he is so good, according to the prosecutor, that we should have a statue for him. But in England, they don't do statues for citizens, so he won't have a statue. But he should have one. So, Statue Man it is. That virtue as had been observed by the poets in many passages, which he well knew the jury would have word for word at the tips of their tongues, whereat the jury's countenances displayed a guilty consciousness that they knew nothing about the passages, was in a manner contagious, more especially the bright virtue known as patriotism or love of country. Okay. <laughs> uh, ultimately, he's saying that there... That virtue, we think of virtue as the opposite of vice. It is, uh, you know, the opposite of sin. So the good things, the good things about a person, they're virtues. And he says virtue has been observed by the poets. And he's, it sounds like he's alluding to some poems that he expects the jury all knows off the top of their head. Like, oh, yes, that poem by Blake and Wordsworth. Yes. Uh, and, of course, the jurors are looking around at each other like, I don't know what poems he's talking about. Um, that ultimately, virtue is contagious. More especially, especially what virtue? What virtue is most contagious? Patriotism or love of country. And you're going to see what he means by that here in a second. That the lofty example of this immaculate and unimpeachable witness for the crown, to refer to whom, however unworthily, was an honor, had communicated itself to the prisoner's servant and had engendered in him a holy determination to de examine his master's table drawers and pockets and secrete his papers. Okay, so in other words, the virtue of this one shining person, statue man, was contagious, and it spread to the servant of the prisoner, who also decided to look through the guy's stuff. And what does he find? That he, Mr. Attorney General, was prepared to hear some disparagement attempted at this admirable servant, but that, in a general way, he preferred him to his, Mr. Attorney General's, brothers and sisters, and honored him more than his, Mr. Attorney General's, father and mother, that he called with confidence on the jury to come and do likewise. <laughs> uh, this other person, this servant, our witness number two, is so amazing that the, the prosecutor says he's better than my own brother and sister and better than my own mother and father. And you know what? You should think of him the same way too. That the evidence of these two witnesses coupled with the documents of their discovering that would be produced would show the prisoner to have been furnished with lists of his majesty's forces and of their disposition and preparation both by sea and land and would leave no doubt that he had habitually conveyed such information to a hostile power. <gasps> yeah, that's what he's saying. Those lists that they found on him, that's what they're going to prove. That these lists could not prove to be in the prisoner's handwriting, but that it was all the same. That, indeed, it was rather the better for the prosecution, as showing the prisoner to be artful in his precautions. <laughs> yeah, so the prisoner is so good. He's such a super criminal that he wrote this stuff, these lists, these super bad lists, in someone else's handwriting. That's how bad he is. That the proof would go back five years and would show the prisoner already engaged in these pernicious missions within a few weeks before the date of the very first action fought between the British troops and the Americans. That, for these reasons, the jury, being a loyal jury, as he knew they were, and being a responsible jury, as they knew they were, must positively find the prisoner guilty and make an end of him whether they liked it or not. That they could never lay their heads upon their pillows. 
that they never could tolerate the idea of their wives laying their heads upon their pillows, that they could never endure the notion of their children laying their heads upon their pillows. In short, that there never more could be for them or theirs any laying of heads upon pillows at all, unless the prisoner's head was taken off. Wow. Quite the guilt trip here. That head, Mr. Attorney General, concluded by demanding of them, in the name of everything he could think of with a round turn in it, and on the faith of his solemn asseveration that he already considered the prisoner as good as dead and gone. When Mr. Attorney General ceased, a buzz arose in the court, as if a cloud of great blue flies were swarming about the prisoner in anticipation of what he was soon to become. All that Social commentary Dickens included in the first two chapters, particularly in chapter two, that had to do with the people and what they were hoping to see happen to the prisoner is all kind of coming back in here in this uh, met in this symbolic uh, description of the people, the crowd, as flies. Why flies? Uh, they swarm in masses. They don't really think for themselves. Uh, they are attracted to death and dead things. And here he, he compares them to a, a crowd of blue flies who are swarming about the prisoner hoping to see what he will become. When toned down again, the unimpeachable patriot appeared in the witness box. Dickens likes describing people not by name sometimes, but by their description. And here, the unimpeachable patriot is Statue Man. This is the uh, witness against Charles Darnay, who is so great that he should have a statue. Mr. Solicitor General then, following his leader's lead, examined the patriot. John Barsad, gentleman by name. Okay, so we got a character. John Barsat, that's who Statue Man is. So if you want to write down Witness Against Darnay and Statue Man to help you remember who John Barsat is, that would be good. Uh, by the way, Mr. Solicitor General is not the defense attorney. It says following his leader's lead. So he's the assistant uh, prosecutor, sorry, assistant to the prosecutor. The story of his pure soul was exactly what Mr. Attorney General had described it to be. Perhaps, if it had a fault, a little too exactly. Okay, what's the fault there? In other words, he is so good by the prosecutor's words, and then says the exact same thing himself. Uh, it sounds like it's almost like forced or lined up or scripted by the prosecutor. Having released his noble bosom of its burden, he would have modestly withdrawn himself, but that the wigged gentleman with the papers before him, sitting not far from Mr. Lorry, begged to ask him a few questions. The wigged gentleman sitting opposite, still looking at the ceiling of the court. I love that there's just this guy who's sitting there staring at the ceiling of the court. Who are these two wigged gentlemen? That's Darnay's, uh, that's Darnay's defense lawyers. Um, the, the wigged gentleman with the papers is the lead lawyer, and then the other guy staring at the ceiling of the court is his assistant. So here, this next paragraph is going to sound like it's coming from the perspective of the defense attorney. Had he ever been a spy himself? No, he scorned the base insinuation. What did he live upon? His property. Where was his property? He didn't precisely remember where it was. What was it? No business of anybody's. Had he inherited it? Yes, he had. From whom? Distant relation. Very distant? Rather. Okay, so this style, actually, I said it was from the perspective of the, uh, of the defense attorney. It's also, you can see, it shifts back and forth. It also is from the perspective of John Barsad, the statue man, the witness. Ever been in prison? Certainly not. Never in a debtor's prison. Didn't see what that had to do with it. Never in a debtor's prison. Come once again. Never. Yes. How many times? Two or three times. Not five or six? Perhaps. Of what profession? Gentlemen. Ever been kicked? Might have been. Frequently? No. Ever kicked downstairs? Decidedly not. Once received a kick on the top of a staircase and fell downstairs of his own accord. Okay, what in the world is the defense attorney doing? What's he asking about? He's not even asking him about the prisoner at all. What's he doing? He's establishing that this guy might not be so reputable. He's not the shining statue citizen that uh, the prosecutor said. He's trying to 
get the jury to recognize that there's a lot of flaw in this man's character. Kicked on that occasion for cheating at dice. Something to that effect was said by the intoxicated liar who committed the assault, but it was not true. Swear it was not true? Positively. Ever live by cheating at play? Never. Ever live by play? Not more than other gentlemen do. By play here, he's referring to gambling, which it would be really frowned upon. They didn't have poker on TV in those days. Ever borrow money of the prisoner? Yes. Ever pay him? No. Was not this intimacy with the prisoner, in reality, a very slight one, forced upon the prisoner in coaches, inns, and packets? No. Sure he saw the prisoner with these lists? Certain. Knew no more about the lists. Remember, the lists are what he's accused of carrying, these lists that had the, uh, the English forces written down on them and that Charles Darnay was carrying over to France. Knew no more about the lists? No. Had not procured them himself, for instance? No. Expect to get anything by this evidence? No. Not in regular government pay and employment to lay traps? Oh, dear, no. Or to do anything? Oh, dear, no. Swear that? Over and over again. No motives but of sheer patriotism? None whatever. Okay, at the end of this, he not only has uh, shown this man to be perhaps disreputable, but then he also kind of weaves in uh, a reason why this man would be perhaps creating false evidence against the prisoner. Perhaps he wrote the lists himself, and perhaps he's turning him in for what reason? To get paid, okay? At that time, the government did pay people to uh, to give testimony against uh, against people who are, uh, who are treasonous. Now shifting to the second witness. The virtuous servant, Roger Cly, swore his way through the case at a great rate. Okay, so Roger Cly, write that down. He's the second witness. He used to be pr the prisoner, or Charles Darnay's servant, and he's the one that found these lists. He had taken service with the prisoner in good faith and simplicity four years ago. He had asked the prisoner aboard the Calais packet if he wanted a handy fellow, and the prisoner had engaged him. He had not asked the prisoner to take the handy fellow as an act of charity, never thought of such a thing. He began to have suspicions of the prisoner and to keep an eye upon him soon afterwards. In arranging his clothes while traveling, he had seen similar lists to these in the prisoner's pockets over and over again. He had taken these lists from the drawer of the prisoner's desk. He had not put them there first. He had seen the prisoner show these identical lists to French gentlemen at Calais and similar lists to French gentlemen both at Calais and Bologna. He loved his country and couldn't bear it and had given information. He had never been suspected of stealing a silver teapot. He had been maligned respecting a mustard pot, but it turned out to only be a plated one. He had known the, he had known the last witness seven or eight years. That was merely a coincidence. He didn't call it a particularly curious coincidence. Most coincidences were curious. Neither did he call it a curious coincidence that true patriotism was his only motive, too. He was a true Briton and hoped there were many like him. The blue flies buzzed again. Okay, so there's a lot there going on. I hope you guys recognize the shift in tone. Middle of this paragraph, actually right when it shifts from, uh, right when it gets from he loved his country and couldn't bear it and had given information to he had never been suspected of stealing a silver teapot. You can see that the person asking him the questions has changed. The first half of this paragraph, we're only seeing the, seeing the answers to the questions. We don't see the questions themselves. But you can tell that the prosecutor is lobbing up softballs for him. Like he's walking him through his story, through his questions, and it brings him right to what he wants to say. Then suddenly, the defense attorney starts asking more attacking questions. Uh, questions that would perhaps, again, show him to be disreputable. Such as, were you ever accused of stealing or suspected of stealing a teapot? And he says, no, it was a mustard pot, but it only was a plated one. It wasn't even like solid, you know, whatever. Uh, and then, by the way, have you known the other witness for seven or eight years? Yeah. So it's just a, you know, a coincidence. At the end, he says he was a true Briton and hoped there were many like them. And how does the crowd think about that? The blue flies buzzed again. In other words, like, rah, 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 America. Um, and Mr. Attorney General called Mr. Jarvis Laurie. 
if I'm honest with you, that's probably the end of the most confusing parts of this. So if you want to read on on your own, go for it. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to post a second video where I read on the rest of this and you can join me there.